Okay, so we've made the vehicle safe. We've managed, mitigated, or monitored all the hazards associated with the vehicle and the environment, and now we're ready to pursue our primary objective, which is get to the victim and start rendering care. We want to make sure that we make access in an adjacent pane of glass, not the one directly associated with the victim. We don't want glass all over the victim. We've already hit those components about the importance of having a good glass retrieval tool or a glass removal tool. Um, in this application, this is an older car, so we don't have to worry about that. We're going to use a window punch. We're going to go ahead and take these two panes of glass, and then we're going to protect the entry point, ideally with Kevlar or extrication blankets. If you don't have Kevlar or extrication blankets to help your EMS provider get in here and not get all cut up, don't use sheets. Don't use sheets. Don't use towels. They will cut and get shredded very, very quickly. So you need something a little bit thicker if you don't have a high-end extrication blanket. So glass is going to come. We make sure that we talk to the victim during this process that they're conscious. So we're going to let them know what's happening so that they're not going to freak out as we start progressing through these sequences. Just like a residential window clean out, we want to remove as much of this glass as possible. It is very important you have appropriate extrication gloves. There are very few extrication gloves on the market that truly have cut resistance. So you want to make sure that you have a glove that has at least level five cut resistance. It'll apply, it'll require about 25 pounds of pressure to actually cut through the surface of the gloves. That's what you're looking for. Anything less than that, we're falling back into that NIOSH report where the most common uh, injury involved with responders on accidents is cuts and lacerations. So this is protected. We're going to take a good blanket. We're going to get this zone right here covered up. If this T-bar for this sail panel window is in the way and doesn't accommodate your EMS provider that's going to come in here, these are very easy to displace or remove very quickly with your extrication tools. Okay. Also, if this is not necessary, if you've already got your tool platforms out, your pump is running, your hoses are running, and you can force this door just as quickly as you can do this, then go ahead and take the door. But in most situations, we're talking about compressing the time frame for this initial assessment, which means 90% of your extrication caches are not going to be up and running yet. That's why we're gaining quick window access for our EMS provider. So Chelsea is the, the lead medic who's going to go ahead and come on up. We're going to help her into the vehicle. If we were to look in here into the seat, we're going to see a lot of glass on the seat. We want to make sure that we clear as much of that off as we can so that she's got a good landing zone and she's not going to get cut. Okay, she's going to start head first in. We're going to help facilitate getting her in through that opening if we need, and then we'll pass her another blanket to get over the victim. You ready, Chelsea? Yep. Okay. okay. Okay, Chelsea's now into the vehicle. She can get reoriented, and Glenn's ready to hand her a blanket. She's going to start her assessment, and I'll let Glenn kind of take over and talk briefly about her priorities on the assessment side. On our side, one of the first things we're going to task Chelsea with now that she's in the interior is we want her to remove the keys and ensure that the vehicle is in park. By her being in the rear of the vehicle and accessing those elements, she, she is reaching in between the two airbag zones. That's the importance of gaining access to those systems from the middle hub of the vehicle as opposed to outside of the window. So Chelsea, will you go ahead and make sure the keys are off and out of the ignition and make sure the vehicle is in park? No keys in the Great. That finishes all of our hazard management. Now, Glenn can take over and talk about the EMS side. So, of course, primary management of a patient that's in an auto accident that needs extrication, extricated, of course, airway, breathing, circulation. Most of the time, we're going to have a good assessment on their airway and breathing status just by talking to the patient from the outside. But further, uh, further assess for that, whether it may be some kind of a chest injury causing a tension pneumothorax or a hemothorax, something like that. Uh, and then finally, finish up with checking your circulation. Look for large sources of bleeding, whether it be external or internal. Um, a lot of that can be, a lot of the external bleeding can be stopped while we have a person in the back, whether it be tourniquet use, uh, heavy dressing with pressure, something to that lines. 
remember, when, when uh, assessing for internal bleeding too, that's going to be a reason for us to get that patient out immediately. If they're complaining of, abdom of abdominal pain, chest pain, something like that, some kind of blood that's in one of those open cavities that's going to cause some kind of pain. Assess for that, assess for vital signs. Remember, pulse is going to jump up way before you ever see anything in the blood pressure. So if you see an elevated pulse that never comes down, look for, consider some sort of internal bleeding if they have also some abdominal pain or, or chest pain as well. So uh, cover your ABCs. When you get from, from there, we can start getting into our more detailed assessment. One of the big things that uh, Dalen's going to talk about is um, neck pain, whether we consider this patient to have a, some kind of spinal, whether it be cervical spine, thoracic, lumbar, etc. Uh, also check where we want to look for uh, any kind of pelvic instability, as that could be not only a big source of bleeding, but it can also be a big complication where we're trying to get the patient out of the vehicle. Um, as well, Chelsea, one of the big things we're going to have her do is look at the steering wheel, look at the pedals, see if there's any kind of impingement on the patient. Uh, with uh, a dash roll, Somebody may have their legs trapped. Don't forget, consider compartment syndrome on somebody who may have had the dash rolled on their legs. Um, consider uh, all the interventions you may need for that and how quickly we need to get the dash off of that patient. So, Dalen, you want to continue talking about where we're going to go from here? Yeah, absolutely. To make this an efficient process, it's really important that these two entities, EMS and rescue, are on the same page and speak some common languages. Um, we're really big advocates of trying to streamline that and, and create some of that. So there's three modes of extrication that we would like to encourage you to implement. Rapid extrication, non-C-spine extrication, and C-spine extrication. I'm going to give you examples of all three of those, and all three of those are driven by Chelsea. So remember as the extrication guys, it is very important that you interface very, very closely with this medic to find out what she desires for care of the patient and what's going to be required for extrication and removal. Rapid extrication is Chelsea enters this equation, she starts the assessment on the victim, and if we don't get the victim out of the car within minutes, this is going to be a recovery and not a rescue. In that application, there's a lot of things that are going to get bypassed as far as care as well as how we take the vehicle down. So a really in-depth and detailed cervical management, a full side out, a full roof removal, those things are probably going to get bypassed and we're going to relocate to more of a door pop and a rapid scoot and get. But that is driven by Chelsea's determination of how she wants to render care. The second option is C-spine. If in the mechanism of injury or in her assessment she identifies that she suspects a cervical injury, um, then we're going to go ahead and manage this extrication sequence so that we can afford the best possible care and management of that injury. Um, that can be coordinated with Chelsea. Typically for us to maximize all the options for that, we're going to do at a minimum a full side out and in most, likely, uh, in most likelihood a full ro roof removal. That gives us the ability to do long axis removals out of the back of the vehicle. It gives us the ability to recline the seat fully and do log rolls. It opens up all the options for whatever she wants so that we can accommodate her desire for care. The last option is non-C-spine. So if Chelsea's entered the vehicle, this is an entrapment issue, but in her assessment, there's no cervical compromise. There's no significant injuries. This is as simple as this patient is just stuck in the vehicle and needs help getting out. We're not going to do any in-depth packaging, any rent, render, any advanced care. That's kind of back to a rapid extrication sequence as far as technique, just not speed. So again, we're focused on just a singular door pop. Okay, so for this uh, illustration today, we're going to do a C-spine removal. So Chelsea's gotten in, she's evaluated the patient, and she's determined best based on the mechanism of injury or the patient presentation, we got to manage that component, okay? The second question I'm going to ask Chelsea before I put my guys to work on an action plan is, are there any impingements? Just like Glenn talked about, she's analyzing brake pedal, steering column, sidewalls of the vehicle, where is the car touching the patient and are they truly entrapped by internal mechanisms or by external mechanisms? It's going to make a big difference in what we do, how we do, okay? So in this series, for this side initially, I talked to Chelsea. Chelsea says, yep, I want to manage cervical, I want to see spine removal. It doesn't look like anything is entrapped other than lower extremities. So we've got some type of steering column or dash impingement on the victim. That means we don't have excessive worries about pelvis. We don't have any significant side impingement, anything that's going to alter how we're going to do this side takedown. Okay? So the victim's access on this side, 
Typically, the rule of thumb is you can pass a hand between the victim and the door, meaning the doors are not impinged on the victim. Okay, that's the application for this for this technique. With this technique, what we're going to do is what's called a rip and blitz. It's very very common, uh, especially around Central Ohio. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the latch mechanism uh, and the nader pin at the back door. We're going to do some cuts on the B post. We're going to shear out the B post, and we're going to hinge both doors and B post all forward as one segment of material. Really, really critical thing to communicate to you as the EMS guys about a common mistake or technique that rescuers use that will put you in harm's way, okay? And it's when we make this high side cut on the B post. As you watch this progression and we talk through it, if the top of the B post is cut before we start shearing out the bottom of the B post or pushing it off to the side, then the top of this B post is going to rotate forward and into the victim. That's going to play a big impact and role, not just in her holding C-spine around the left side of the headrest, but also in the possibility of further injuring the victim. So it's really important, if you see your rescue guys starting to make a, a, an initial cut up here, ask them to slow down and stop if you have any concerns about this B post impacting the victim. All right. Now, so Dalen, one of the, the sequence. Go ahead. I'm go sorry. Ahead. One of the things that uh, I know has been beefed up on cars here, especially with the posts, yep. is the metals, the integrity of the metals that makes it harder for us as rescuers to remove that. What is, uh, what's kind of a rule of thumb as to what's out there as far as like the, the boron and, ex and, and metals like that? Right. Um, it all depends on the manufacturer of the tools. Uh, and we're not going to get real in depth into that today. But there are tools that will, hydraulic cutters that will readily cut uh, and separate high strength steels. And there are hydraulic tools that won't. Uh, if you have an, a newer or exotic type car that you think does have high energy steel or, or high strength steel in it, and your extrication team is struggling with segmenting that, cutting through it, or removing it. The next best option, if their hydraulic tools can't handle it, is specialized blades, carbide tipped blades for recip saws. Okay. That's the only other way to get it, and that does create more uh, possible risk factors for you guys on the inside. If I make a hydraulic cut here, it's a very controlled presentation of the blades. If I come up here with a recip saw and start driving through this B post, now I have an oscillated blade that's moving in and out directly towards the victim and directly towards my care provider. So you're just going to have to kind of be dependent upon how well equipped your rescuers gotcha. are and work through that sequence. Yep, yeah. great question. All right, so the guys are going to come up and cut, and I'm going to kind of talk through this sequence as they're developing. Uh, good extrication teams will use two tools simultaneously at all times. When we get ready to start here, one other very quick point I want to talk about, especially from Chelsea's perspective, is how we create this purchase point back here. Uh, a lot of rescuers want to come up, they want to open their spreaders, and they want to squeeze this door. A couple things are going to happen that you should be prepared for on the inside. If this door gets squeezed, number one, you're taking a heavy tool, you're advancing in the window, and you're bringing it down to try and get a compression on this door. Watch your leg, okay? A lot of these tools are around 50 pounds. They all have pointy tips on them. If the rescuer loses control of that tool, it is going to slide down and strike you as the, as the caregiver inside. So make sure your leg's off to the side. The other downside of doing a door compression like this is it starts the energy of the door deflecting inward. So if you have a rescue team that does this, Chelsea, the first thing you should expect is when they go to force this door, the door is going to come towards you in the middle crease point of the door. So are you advocating then not to pinch the door? Right, and you guys probably aren't going to actually, on the EMS side, it'll be tough to really dictate every step of technique to the rescuers, but you can definitely communicate to that to them if you have a concern about that movement. So if you need to stay in a position that's very close to this, to this door wall, you're going to make sure you talk to them about the importance of not sending the door towards you. And you can ask them, hey, can you please do a window spread as opposed to a door squeeze? Okay. A window spread is going to put both of our tips high up on the roof rail, and then on the top of the door, it's going to capture both door elements, inner and outer panel, and it's going to open the door up this way. So it's going to start all the energy of the door coming away from Chelsea and away from our victim and open up our gaps up here around the window rail so that we can get in here and start accessing the latch. Okay. So, Bobby, go ahead and get the crank in there. Bobby's going to come up in the opening. He's going to set his tips back. He's going to talk to Chelsea, watch his angle, and he's going to do some spreading in there. Also want to advocate, don't forget to cover your patient during this and prepare them for what all is going on. Uh, situations like this can be very scary. Their patients are already injured, and then to hear a bunch of loud tools to their brand new car, awfully tough.
So as Bobby drives this down, he's trying to gain access into this portion right here so that he can stay away from the seams of the door panel and start pushing the inside door skin out. Go ahead and make your access there. Okay, now once we create these gaps, as the rescuer inside, one of the things that can be pretty alarming for both the rescuer and the victim is when we pop these doors. So if we do full spreads, we're gonna have very uh, kinetic energy-based reactions to that motion on the spreaders. So we're big advocates of, especially if we have uh, a wound up patient, okay? We're big advocates of gapping and then cutting. That way we don't have those violent reactions to our door components. So Bobby has built the gap that Scott needs to come in and cut the nader pen. This is going to be a much more controlled removal of the door. As Scott continues to work through this rear portion of the door, Bobby is going to reorient up towards the front of the vehicle and he's going to start attacking this fender so that we're prepared to manage the movement of the dash assembly. Okay, Bobby's got that compressed now. He's gonna skin out that body panel finner so we can expose the structural elements. And here's something that really, really important facet about your awareness on the inside and what the rescuers are doing. Before any vertical posts or roof rails get cut, as a rescuer on the inside of the vehicle, you wanna make sure that these guys are taking good care of you and that they're removing all the cosmetic panels inside of these posts. If we have SRS components hidden, hidden or embedded in any of those posts and we cut them without identifying them, we can have catastrophic, catastrophic failures of those mechanisms. What are those failures? You can have anything from 1500 degree Fahrenheit chemical burns to rapid expansions of steel pellets that will deploy out of seatbelt tensioners um, to accidental deployments of airbags. So all three of those hazards are very real. Uh, very potentially lethal and very damaging. So make sure, Chelsea, if you see these guys coming at this with a cutter and they're getting ready to snip a, a, a component and they've gotten in a hurry and they have not skinned out the plastics, ask them to stop, ask them to skin things out and identify okay. where their stuff is. So Scott's working on that on the inside. Bobby's going to peel that fender off and then we're going to work on a low side cut down here on the B post. Okay, so while this cut is being made on the bottom down here, these tools have a tendency when placed interior for these B-cuts to swing towards the rescuer. So Chelsea needs to make sure again that she's communicating with this guy, we're positioning well, and that these guys are managing their tools so that they're not loading you or loading the patient's seat. Once that low side cut is made, Bobby is then gonna come in here, place his tips between the rocker and the rear door, Push it about a 45 degree angle and you will notice that we have left the top of the B post intact. So that's that point we talked about earlier. If this gets cut before we shear this out, Chelsea, this is going to swing right into the victim's shoulder and into his head and everything's going to kind of articulate that way. So make sure that that's not happening. Go ahead, Bobby. No. Stop. Okay, as soon as that starts to gap, 
The next thing you've got to identify is the status of your seatbelt. Remember that when an impact occurs, the seatbelt pretensioners lock the seatbelts into position. So if your seatbelt is locked into position and your seatbelt pretensioner is located on this B post and we start driving the B post, invariably we're tensioning the seatbelt on the victim. So Chelsea, when you see any displacements like this, you'll want to keep an eye on that seatbelt. If you see it compressing the victim, make sure you tell these guys stop and make sure that we manage the seatbelt and get it cut, okay? So let's go ahead and get that snipped. Okay, now Bobby's going to complete his shear out. Good. Okay. Now our, our cut man is now going to come in. Cut man is going to make any final cuts on any remaining sheet metal at the bottom, and then he's going to cut the high side of the B post. You got a little bit at the bottom there, Scott. and we've opened up the side of the vehicle. We now we can see we have great exposure routes. We got a clean segmented removal of the B post, so all of this is out of the way. If we need to recline the seat, get more rescuers in here, whatever management technique Chelsea wants to use for um, our cervical management is now accessible and available to us. The last element that we talked about this in this scenario is dash impingement, okay, or steering wheel impingement. We have lower extremity entrapment. Um, so at this point, we ideally want to remove these door systems, set everything off to the side, and then get prepped to move whatever is entrapping the victim up here. So uh, Scott's going to come up with the cutters. He's going to attack these hinge points up here, and he's going to separate both those hinges and the keeper mechanism on the A-post. Again, we're going to watch that victim. We're going to make sure that the tool doesn't swing into the victim. 